when the muscles are recruited like that and people are biting forward, doesn't that tend to open the airway? Isn't that kind of like what bruxism attempts to do at a lizard brain level? Mm, that's great. So if you recruit your pharyngeal muscles and they are contracting almost in a swallow mechanism, your airway is getting smaller. Yeah. It's a sphincter. I mean, it's not a complete sphincter because the pharyngeal is attached to the buccinators, but in many ways it is. And so down low, it'll, it'll, it'll tighten up and close. Yeah. So I love your question about bruxism because um, we as clinicians, we like to create logical explanations for what's going on, right? And sometimes we fall trapped to logical fallacy. And as and, philosophers, we like to do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> it's what we thrive on, you know. And, um, and sometimes it's also good to use logical fallacy to get people to believe that you're smart. So, but it's, we, we, need to, we need to accept what we know, yes. But again, science is never settled. So we have to stay open to other ideas. Yeah. The way that I learned about Ruxism um i learned it from a neurochemical point of view so what happens when what happens when the patient is not breathing is that there's a sympathetic response so there's a there's there's a flood of neurotransmitters and the main neurotransmitters that are involved are epinephrine norepinephrine dopamine and serotonin right fight or flight yeah, exactly. So all these get blown out and the main, the main neurotransmitter that's responsible for rhythmic muscle contraction is dopamine. And so what you have is bruxism is not the only thing that we see in apnea patients. Uh, bruxism is one of the contractions. The other contraction we see is uh, wrist flexion. We also see elbow flexion. And so people who have sleep apnea, guess what else they have? They have carpal, carpal tunnel, tunnel syndrome wow. and they have tennis elbow. And then the other sign, uh, the other is extension of the feet. And so what do they have? Oh. They have plantar fasciitis. Right. So one of the main giveaways, somebody walks through the door and they've listed on their medical history, oh, I've had carpal tunnel release. And then they're gingerly walking into the room. You're like, oh, this is a sleep apnea patient, you know, guarantee. Yeah. Because they're in complete muscle contraction. So do I know that this is true? No. The studies are kind of uh, pending. I, I'm trying to do a study with a guy here in town who's a hand surgeon. Uh, who does all the carpal tunnel releases in town. So our, our goal is, is to do HI, you know, home, home sleep studies pre-carpal tunnel to see what percentage of carpal tunnel patients actually have undiagnosed sleep apnea. So we're in the process of like re researching these things. Um, but, you know, there's a nurse at the hospital. He walks in in his boot and I'm like, what's up? And he's like, oh, I have plantar fasciitis. I said, yeah, you're like 80 pounds overweight, lose some weight and you won't have sleep apnea anymore. He said, I have sleep apnea. I said, guarantee you have sleep apnea. Go get tested. You know, here's this here. Come by the office, pick up the at home sleep test. Yeah. So um, yeah. that so bruxism, mm -hmm. we have created this possible. I'm, I'm willing to say that this is the protective mechanism for waking up. Sure. And, and I heard Jeff Rouse preached that in Chicago about 12 years ago. Uh, and uh, Jeff Rouse, he teaches this uh, triad, right? It's um, acid reflux, bruxism, and sleep apnea, right? Well, guess where the re reflux comes from? For so there's two principle. aspects. What's that? Uh, you tell us. I've heard. I've no, heard you, you said it. You, you, you nailed the one aspect, which yeah. is pressure, right? right? Pressure gradient. A negative pressure vacuuming as, uh, gastric acids and gastric juices up into the throat. Yep. yep. But guess which neurotransmitter is responsible for acid release in the stomach? It's serotonin. So 
you get a serotonin surge. So then why do kids get, why do kids get uh, ADHD who have apnea? Uh, I mean, that's the question, right? So when, when the body is secreting too much neurotransmitter, the, uh, the body responds by decreasing receptors, right? It's just, it's like the homeostasis of the body. You flood the system with more um, communicators, and in this case, neurotransmitters, then the receiving end, the receptors go down. So what happens is you get a kid, you flood the frontal cortex with epinephrine, norepinephrine, the neurotransmitters, uh, the receptors decrease because of this constant flood. Then you send this kid out into public during the day with fewer receptors. They have, they have ADHD, right? So how do we solve this problem? We give them more. You flood, right? you flood it more with yeah, yeah. We throw Adderall and Ritalin at them during right. the day to make up for the lack of receptors. Is all of this true? There's some data that reports that it is true. So wow. I, I prefer the neurotransmitter axis explanations for a lot of these sleep problems because that's exactly the explanations that occur in cardiology. So when you talk about stroke risk, hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, arrhythmia, um, the cardiologists explain these side effects of apnea um, using the neurotransmitter model or the you know, the catecholamine model in the body. Wow. So, so just to clarify the distinction you just drew, maybe it's not that bruxism is about making the these tissues erect in order to breathe better. It's just that you have this flood of neurotransmitters and that's just causing clenching, so to speak, everywhere, all over the body. And it's not really this intelligent adaptation of, you know, or a compensation to open the airway. It's more random than that. Um, I, again, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of ecumenical until proven. Otherwise yeah. I'm okay. Believing both. Yeah. But I really believe the neurotransmitter model. Wow. 